And of course, the burnt offering, the key to God, was the aroma. Now, we don't really, again, that's an anthropo what? The smell. Yeah, you've got a nose, you've got a smell. And, and the smell was for the Father, it wasn't for the people. When, the, when it was, and here's what it means, when it was properly prepared, and there was a protocol to, the, to, to, to doing that, the lamb or, or whatever the sacrifice was had to be without blemish and spot, then it had to be prepared a certain way, and it had to be, everything had to be done by protocol. And when it was done and roasted, then the smell of what it represent, the symbolism to God, right? The smell was the, the soothing smell of humans, believers honoring the sacrifice of Christ to be. The burnt offering is, is in the book of Hebrews. You study chapter 7 through 10, and you'll know all about this in the heart of God. He explains all of that, of what it mean, meant to him in the old covenant. And so an aroma, the aroma was always, it was, the aroma wasn't for the people. Like, you know, you put your nose to the, you go like, that smells like steak. No, that's hot dogs. No, that's chicken. No, that's beef, Right? But that's not what that, that this, this is about the offering was done properly by the will of God. And it represented the complete work of Christ on the cross. The burnt offering represented the complete work of Christ on the cross. It represented John 1930 when Jesus said it is finished. And the soothing smell is, is the acceptance, is God's acceptance from the heart of a faithful and proud father seeing his, his child do this properly with a good heart, a thankful heart. And so that verse 21, the smell and then the seasons, the acceptance, he gives, he gives a promise. He says, I will never again curse the ground. I never will again destroy all, uh, uh, every living thing. That's negative. Well, I guess it's a positive, but I never, I never will do that again. And then he said, while the earth remains, you know how long it's going to remain? Through the second coming of Christ. It's going to have another change during the millennium. Right? The curse, the curse upon the ground of Adam's sin is going to be removed. And then it's going to be refined by fire. And then we go to the new heavens and new earth. Well, the earth remains. And this is for us in the post alluvian period. Seed time harvest, cold heat. Not cease, shall never cease. So I think that's important for us. What is really interesting is that this offering was voluntary. Noah did this voluntarily. <clears throat> and that always pleases God. When you do the will of God, it always pleases the Father, right? He Hebrews eleven six, 6, faith, right? Faith pleases. Hebrews eleven six. 6, faith pleases God. When we go through the faith cycle drill, it pleases him. Noah voluntarily offered the messianic sacrifice to worship the Lord. As Psalms 2.11 says, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. And that certainly would have reflected Noah in this offering. The second thing that might be of interest to us, it was an altar of worship because of the offering the offering was a messianic sacrifice offering. And you, you need to understand that the altar of worship is all about what you are bringing. 
to it? What are you bringing to it? What are you bringing? Not what you think you want to get from it, but what are you bringing that would be, uh, look, Cain and Abel, they brought an offering, right? Both brought an offering. One, one wanted something from it, one brought it as a gift. The other brought it as to get something from it. How do I know it? By the way he reacted when it was un, well, not accepted, right? Well, yeah, that's in the fourth chapter of Genesis. You could read that. Listen, you've got to remember that when you bring offerings to the Lord. Right? It's not what you get, it's what you bring. I mean, people have got some of the screwiest ideas about sacrificing for the Lord I've ever heard in my life. You need to make sure you got all that cleared up in your soul. The burnt offering sacrifice was a picture of the substitutional death for a cleansed and forgiven believer. That's Noah. Unbelievers didn't offer, didn't do burnt offerings. Believers did. That would be a picture to you and I of 1 John 1, 9. The burnt offering of shadow Christology, I'm under point two, taught great doctrines of grace salvation in the Gentile age, such as propitiation. It taught propitiation. It taught everything that the cross of Christ does for you and I. It taught propitiation. It taught reconciliation. It taught redemption, justification. It taught all that stuff. You need to know that from Galatians 3.8. I mean, how was, Noah, how was Noah saved? He was the same, same way Abraham was. They got saved as Gentiles. Right? Well, yeah. They went from Seth to Shem, right? I mean, he was a Shemite, Abraham. He was a Gentile when he got saved. I mean, he, he wasn't, didn't become a Jew until he got circumcised under the law, under, under the covenant. Well, anyhow, just showed his place in the plan of God. I mean, what shows your place in the plan of God? You know, did you ever think about that? I mean, what shows your place? Well, even better than that, what, what shows your place as a, as, as a member of a church? Give me an answer to that. Your spiritual gift. Your spiritual gift. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how important is that? And so many don't even know they have a spiritual gift. They don't know what spiritual gifts are. Imagine how, 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 how bad that is. Well, look, here's 1 John 2.2. Here's 1 John 2, 2. He himself, that means he alone, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Give me a simple definition of propitiation. And we talked about this Sunday here. Give me, just give me a simple definition. Yeah, it appeases, it appeases the wrath. Not what you do is what Christ does for you that satisfies that in propitiation. And propitiation always applies to your life once you believe the gospel of Christ. It's always there for you. You will never be, it, it appeases the wrath of God. It appeases John, John 3, 18 and 36 condemnation and, and wrath. It appeases the wrath of God. It satisfies the justice of God and his love for mankind in sending his son. Right? John 3.16. Yeah. So when he, when he offers his burnt offering, it, it just reflects everything in his heart about what his salvation means. Noah's salvation to himself. He, he does this to the Lord in, in respect for what God has offered him in salvation in Christ. He didn't.
didn't get saved some other way. He got saved just like you and I, but it was a, a prophetic gospel. Galatians 3, 8. He himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only ours only, which means unlimited atonement, but also for those of the whole world. My, my, my. Not just ours, but the whole world. Now, here's the tragedy of this. The whole world died except for how many people? How, how many on the, on the eight. eight? My. Boy, pray for me, Alan. Only eight people. Think of the uncles and the aunts and the cousins and the nephews. Family. Right? You know, they got, we know their genealogy when you study Genesis 5. All those people. I think about that. Don't you think about those in your family that, that don't honor God the way they live? They don't honor God in their salvation. The, they're going to come out of this whole thing smelling like a rose. Listen, look at And the, the intents of the heart was evil every minute of every day. Can you imagine that? Just a little bit of evil drives me nuts. I got where I can't even watch news anymore. It just drives me crazy. Every day they come up with some more stuff, and I go like, you're going to destroy everything. It's, and it, it's just every day. I mean, you talk about the first 100 days. My goodness. Uh, and you know what the answer is? What did Noah do every day? Every time a crowd gathered around him working on the ark, you know what he did? He stopped and did what? He preached the righteousness of God. 2 Peter 2, in there about verse 5. What do you think we ought to be doing when we see evil like this? Huh? You, you keep doing what you're doing. You, you preach it, you preach the gospel of grace salvation until the ship sails. Every day. Every day. Listen, the more the darkness, the greater the light. Agreed? <laughs> I mean, how important, the darker it gets in America, how more important it is to shine that light for Christ. Keep your... Keep your lamp with the oil of the Holy Spirit full. All of this was fulfilled by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 17. He said, I didn't come to abolish it, the law. I came to fulfill it. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 11 through 15. Verse 14 says, how much more? Always pay attention to that in the book of Hebrews. How much more? Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9.14. You ought to read uh, the 10th chapter of Hebrews where you deal with, he deals with shadow Christology and he tells you that all these sacrifices that were offered under the old covenant are all rolled up into one. The sacrifice, listen to me now, the sacrifice of sacrifices. Now think about that. Because they had a lot of, they had a lot. Listen, that, that ark was filled with clean animals and uncleaned animals. What were the clean animals for? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. 
They only ate eight on the boat. That's a lot of sacrificing. Today, under the new covenant, all the sacrifices are rolled up into one. Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. All of it's wound up in that. Like, you should read Romans, the fourth chapter, like 23 through 25 there in the end and see the dynamics of that. Romans, the fourth chapter, 23, at least 23 through 25, you ought to see the dynamics of that. And of course, we see it at John, in John 19, 30, when he said on the cross, it is finished, the teleastai. Put it in the perfect tense. It's rolled up. All the sacrifice rolled up in this one. It's good because we Gentiles couldn't keep up with all these animals and all the stuff we had to do and how you had to, do, how you had to clean them and wash them and <laughs> cook them and all that kind of stuff. Well, anyhow... And, and listen, it, what Noah did was a priesthood function. Point number three, messianic sacrifices go back to the Garden of Eden. You say, well, where did this start? It seemed to be going full steam with, with, with Noah, which was the tenth of the genealogy of the first phase of Gentiles from Adam through Seth to Noah. By the time we get to the tenth, Burnt offering is kind of commonplace, ain't it? And he really understands it. I mean, he, he really does understand it. The Messianic sacrifice that Noah did goes back to the Garden of Eden and Adam's original sin. AOS is Adam's original sin. In Genesis 2.25, pre-fall, before Adam fell, we are told, and the man, and the, and the word man in the English, in the Hebrew is Adam. That's where you get the name Adam. It's the Hebrew for man, but anyhow. And the man and his wife, we know her as Eve, the mother of all what? Living. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That's before the fall, right? In the Genesis 3-7, that was Genesis 2-25, in 3-7, after the fall, then their eyes were opened, and he's talking about the eyes of their soul, like Ephesians 1.18. And they knew, see, that's how you know we're talking about the eyes, not what they saw, what they knew. So you know we're talking about the eyes of their soul, right? Come on now. Their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sew fig leaves together and made loin coverings. You know, I said, well, anyhow, let's just leave it alone. So when you read Genesis, the third chapter and the fourth chapter, you get all this information. Now, when you go to the fourth chapter, you've got family, you've got you got Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and then, of course, there's a murder in the family, and then we have Seth. Uh, one murder and one, one is excommunicated. Yeah? Now, here's what I want you to do, because I didn't write down your paper. I thought about it coming in. I want you to write on your paper under point number three. Write this down, because I'm going to show you why did Cain murder Eva. What was the root cause? 1 John 3, 12. You know what it was? Evil. You know what, where evil comes from? Satan. The devil. Just, you know, if you write the word devil down, take the first letter off, and that's where evil comes from. Yeah? 1 John 3, 12. Evil and the devil. After Adam and Eve sinned, you know, by violating the command of Genesis 2, 16, 7, don't eat from the tree, they hid themselves from God because they saw themselves naked and ashamed in the presence of God. Their need was a need to be saved. 
Isn't that interesting? Because they had fallen from their innocence, hadn't they? The period of innocence in the garden, their sin has separated them. And we're born, we're, we are born into the human race in that state of condition, in need of salvation. And when we, when, we, when we get to that place in our personal life, when we're no longer innocent, then sin becomes an issue with us. And it varies in all kinds of people, doesn't it? Some people lose their innocence very early in life. Maybe on their own, maybe not. Others are later in life with it, aren't they? Well, yeah, I mean, you got, you've had kids and grandkids and all this kind of stuff. You know that. All right? Yeah. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, the Bible says, in Genesis 3.8. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God asked them two important questions. Now listen, to this. This, is, this is how loving and nurturing God is with people in sin. Did they sin? Yes. And, they get, they, and, and they're, they're, they're having the difficulty of experiencing the consequences on how to deal with it. Agreed? Yes. Now watch. I, I want you to see the compassion of God. He asked two questions. <clears throat> this is found in verse, this is Genesis 3.11. He asked, who told you you were naked? And second, have you eaten from the tree of which I command you not to eat? Now, God knows the answer to both of them, but they don't. This is why they need to be saved. It used to be they sat in the presence of God in the cool of the day at Bible study and got everything that fell from his lips. Understood it clearly. Now they don't understand a thing. In fact, they run from the presence out of shame and guilt and all the other things that have flooded their soul. Well, what I see in here is the man who asked the questions. What I look for is how God deals with them. I want to see that because I understand from the man side of it. <laughs> I understand from the human side. What I want to see is how God treats me when I don't measure up. And what he wants to do is to bring us to a, a reckoning within ourselves of what our need is to get back into the presence of God and enjoy it. They're in the, listen, th they don't, and they're not enjoying where they are, and they're, they, they don't even have, I, if I could get back in the presence, I don't know how I can do that. But right now, I don't think I would enjoy it if I got back. Isn't that strange how we think? But how does God think in the midst of all that struggle within us? Oh, I think God would, could never forgive me. I don't think I can't forgive myself. Say, that's what their problem is, isn't it? They can't forgive themselves. And they think because they can't do that for themselves, they think God can't do it for them either. The truth of the matter is, God is ready to do it, isn't he? We set and mill over stuff that God's ready to move on with. Confess your sin and let's get on. And, and, and Noah understands that when he does this burnt offering. Listen, Adam and Eve are going to understand it when, when God does the offering. And how do we know he did it? Because he covered their nakedness with, a, with, a, with a, a garment of righteousness that was provided by God and God alone. Right? I mean, God covered them. And, and that's true with you and I, and he always does. Our sin, listen, when we confess our sin, it's always, always covered by the righteousness of Christ. It's always covered by the righteousness of Christ. It's called positional righteousness. Righteousness. 
and, and listen, God gets thrilled with the idea that you've confessed your sin. And once you get through with that, then he can deal with it in a different light. Prior to that, there's consequences to it. Agreed? Once the confession is done, there's no longer consequences from his side. There could be from yours, right? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you could have walked through a fire, got burnt, and now you got, got to heal up and all that kind of stuff. You get wounded. But from his side, it's good. the struggle sometimes is not that God hasn't forgiven me, it's that I can't forgive myself, right? I'm struggling with that, see? Part of it. And I, I do understand the human side of it, but listen, if you understand the divine side, it takes away all that pressure from the human side. I mean, do you, are you telling me, Pastor, that if I confess, God will forgive me? Yes. Any sin? Yes. Any sin? Well, I don't know. Did Christ die one death for all sin? Does the Bible say that? Of course it says that. So why are you asking me questions like that? Right? I know why you're asking, because you can't believe that God is that merciful to you. I understand that question, but that's not the character of God. The character of God is not that way. And a lot of times we don't bring it to God because we don't think that we would be worthy enough even to bring it. Your worth, listen, your worth is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ, not in yourself. It's not the worth that you bring to the plate. It's the worth that you get when you come to the plate. The place of redemption. The place of forgiveness. If you will confess your sins, God says, I am faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you, right? He doesn't ask you about all that baggage you're carrying about. Well, I don't know if he can do that. I don't know why. Listen, just listen to what God says he'll do for you when you do what he says for you to do. He says, you confess your sin. I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will restore you. And you need to live in the dynamics of that promise and stop beating yourself up. You carry stuff that's already been forgiven. Right? Why are you doing that? You're trying to punish yourself. You're trying to do penance for something grace has already forgiven you about. <clears throat> It's, it's not about your sin. You don't confess your sin because that's, it's to restore you to sanctification. The reward for confession is sanctification. It is this marvelous ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That fifth chapter of Galatians is well worth your read on the internet. You people should read that. Read the whole fifth chapter. Understanding nakedness before God after their sin was the realization that they were now spiritually dead. Nakedness was a realization. Well, wait a minute. Come on. Look up here. Look. look. What was the command with the tree business? Don't eat of the tree. In the day you eat, die and you will die. Yeah, and that, that's absolutely, and King James, and in the English, they will say, you shall surely die. But the, in, the, in the Hebrew, it says dying, you will die. It, it's, a, it's a reference to a double death business. You see? What they realized in their nakedness from their sin, which was eating from the tree, a realization, a realization that their nakedness separated them from the presence of God, that was spiritual death. That's my phone. I forgot to turn it on. Da, 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 da. Yeah. You understand that? Before my phone rang. 
It's probably God calling. Later. Later. Yeah, later. <laughs> Understanding nakedness. What does that nakedness mean? Well, that's what it meant to them. As a result of Adam's original sin, the entire human race is born spiritually dead or naked. Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21, well worth your read. Or Ephesians 2 and or Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 10. In shadow Christology, such as Noah's burnt offering, God taught them the doctrine of the messianic sacrificial offering for the propitiation and redemption. <clears throat> Point number four, we'll close this thing out. Noah's burnt offering represented a priesthood function out of a Gentile age. Boy, that's powerful. You, you want to get that one under your belt. This is the antediluvian civilization. This is the first of two phases of the Gentile age, the Sethites and the Shemites. This is... The Sethites, Noah. Noah was, Noah was the last of that. When they get off the ark, it's going to go to Sham. And the Shemites, that would be the second phase of the Gentile age. Noah's priesthood understood why the clean animals were on the ark and understood they had to be offered without blemish and spot, no birth defects, no growth defects. The body had to be had to be perfect by, by, by law, God's covenant, in order for the blood to work. Body and the blood, right? That's our Eucharist, is it not? The bread and the cup. He bore our sins on his body. His blood is, is what God requires for the complete redemptive program. Well, somebody else is calling. Apparently he couldn't get me, so he's after somebody else. It also shows the importance of clean and unclean animals, of course, on the ark that takes us back to chapter 7 and now into chapter 8. Look, 1 Peter 1, 19 through 20 talks about the animals reflected shadow Christology without blemish or spot, no growth effects. That's the virgin birth, no, no, no effects, no growth effects. That's virgin birth on the one side and impeccability on the other side of the redemptive program of God through Christ. Jesus was a priest, now remember. Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron, because Jesus Christ was the sacrifice of the sacrifices for the sin of the world, Hebrews 7 through 10. And of course, John refers to him as the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world in John 1, 29. Therefore, all church-age believers our holy and royal priest after the order of Jesus Christ. See, and, this, and the writer of Hebrew goes into great links on that from chapter 7 through 10. Also, you can read about this in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. In 1 Peter 2, 5, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up sacri spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He's speaking to the church. Isn't that interesting? 1 Peter 2, 9 through 11. He goes on. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Notice not only are we a holy one, but we're a royal one a holy nation of people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellency of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as alien and strangers in this world to abstain from the fleshly lust which wars against your soul. So there we have it. Noah gets off the ark. First thing he does is build an altar, and upon that altar he gives a burnt offering as a thankful heart to God for Christ.
this as a guy who was faithful to preach that message when only eight would believe. So you have to be faithful, right? We do the Eucharist. What do we say? We proclaim his death until he comes. That's what Noah did. And he's still doing it. He, he steps off into a, a new mission field, doesn't he? Man, when Noah gets off the boat, he's a missionary. When he, when he got on the boat, he was a preacher. Now he's a missionary. He's gone to the new world. Well, Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. We don't offer sat burnt offerings and all the sacrifices of the Old Covenant, but we still offer sacrifices, Peter writes. It's how we live. How we live. We live by the will of God in the power of the Spirit, walking by faith. For this is what pleases God. This is the sweet aroma of the church. May we be those people every day that will offer a sacrifice of our life in Christ to God our Father. And live in such a way, not by law but by grace, that it brings a sweet smell, not a foul odor of carnality. In Jesus' name, amen.